Good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you here to the American Australian Association's inaugural Business Resilience Webinar. We're happy to feature Nicholas Stone, the CEO and founder of Bluestone Lane. I'm Melissa Babbage, the Vice Chair of the AAA. I'm an also a non-executive board member of Swiss Re, of Flirty, which is a drone delivery startup, the University of New South Wales Foundation, and I'm currently living in uh, Washington, DC. This webinar is part of the American Australian Association's ongoing series, providing information, resources, and stories to Australians and Americans affected by COVID-19. During this webinar, due to time constraints, there won't be any live questions. However, we do thank those who have pre-submitted questions, and I will be asking uh, many of those later, and certainly capturing the direction of many of the questions that were submitted. So thank you for those. Um, now, I'd really like to introduce our guest today, Nicholas Stone. Greetings, Nick. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for having me. It's a, a, real, it's a real pleasure for us to have you. Thank you. Um, just by way of background uh, for our audience, so Nicholas or Nick James Stone is a native of Melbourne, Australia, who moved to New York City in 2010. Nick envisions Bluestone Lane whilst attending business school in New York with the idea of providing a premium coffee cafe experience that wasn't readily found in New York, but certainly was very readily found in his former hometown of Melbourne. Nick joined Bluestone Lane as its full-time CEO in June 2016, having spent 10 years as a corporate finance director with ANZ Banking Group and with UBS Investment Bank, in which he was advising and financing some of the world's largest multinational corporations in the United States, Europe, and in Asia Pacific. So since opening its first location in July 2013, Bluestone Lane has become the fastest growing premium coffee and cafe brand in New York City, having opened 55 locations and a flagship coffee roastery and production facility in less than seven years of operations, which was really, really, really fast growth. Revenues had grown aggressively to $55 million over that time. Bluestone Lane has operations across eight North American core markets, including New York, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Washington DC, San Francisco, LA, Toronto and Boston, and employed more than 850 staff. In July 2018, Bluestone Lane announced it had closed the strategic funding with RSE Ventures, a private investment firm founded by Stephen Ross and Matt Higgins, which specialises in incubating, operating and growing consumer brands with a focus on food, technology, sports and media. Um, and one would think that that was a fairly seminal moment in the history of the company. In 2019, Nick was selected as a finalist in EY's Entrepreneur of the Year, New York. So well done on that. Um, Nick holds a Bachelor of Business in Banking and Finance from Monash University in Melbourne, a Master of Applied Finance from Financial Securities Institute of Australasia, a Graduate Diploma in Management from the Melbourne Business School, an advanced postgraduate diploma in Treasury from Fordham Graduate School of Business in, in New York. Um, uh, among the other many strings that he has uh, to his bow, uh, prior to banking, Nick was a professional Australian rules football player for six seasons. He was selected in the 1999 AFL National Draft straight out of high school. Uh, Nick played for Collingwood, Hawthorne and St Kilda Football Club. Nick is married to Alexandra Knight, and they have uh, two children, two young children, actually, which um, as many of you who are dealing with work and children and everything happening in the one, uh, you know, under the one roof, um, I can only imagine what that's like right now. So, um, Nick, I wanted to hand over to you to, um, you know, just take us through um, a little bit uh, about, you know, yourself, the company, uh, where you came from, why it came into being, um, just a few introductory thoughts before we move into some Q&A. So thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, auspicious introduction. Um, uh, you know, I, what's interesting about Bluestone Lane is it's heavily influenced by the premium coffee and cafe culture 
you find commonly in Australia, particularly um, Melbourne, where I was from. And I think what makes it really unique uh, from, from my perspective is that this is my first hospitality venture. I'd never worked a day in hospitality. So when formulating the business concept and building the brand, you know, I was pretty much unbridled. I had an ability to challenge any of the pre-existing rules, um, to look at different ways that it could be created uh, while leveraging my experience in banking and understanding how companies create value and manage risk and grow. Uh, and then also in sports, um, particularly team sports. I'm not a particularly good individual sportsman. I love being part of the team and, and implementing those high performance standards really underpin the success of Bluestone for, for a number of early years. Um, so we started with very humble ambitions. We uh, had a first store in the subterranean class B office tower in Midtown East in Manhattan. It was very conveniently located close to ANZ, which is located at uh, 277 Park Avenue. So you could go out the back entrance, select a couple block avenue and then one block north and you'd be there. Um, no visibility outside. We weren't allowed any sandwich signs and there was no decals. You, you had to go down this escalator that was constantly broken to find it. And me, pretty much immediately, um, it really resonated uh, with, with customers. And, uh, and we talk about our customer being a local. And because that really underpinned why Bluestone was formulated that I didn't want to feel like a homogenous customer that was based on transaction. Be a local where there's reciprocity, where I have invested in the relationship and I know your name and face and order. And conversely, you know my name and face and order. And that's a big thing in Australia where you find everyone makes good coffee. It's sort of like a hygiene factor, a ticket to play, but everyone has their own local. And it's typically because of that interpersonal relationship that what we describe as recognition um, that I really thought was lacking. Um, uh, so in addition to that, you know, after we started our first store, we quickly opened the second one. Um, what really acted as a catalyst to get it going was, was my interest and the change of myopic, my myopic view on Starbucks and the success of Starbucks to build um, at that stage in 2011, uh, the, at the end of 2010, sub 2011, Starbucks market cap hit 85 billion. It has proceeded to hit 100 billion US. Now to understand the market position and the power that they've been able to achieve this, 40% of all coffee shops in the US are Starbucks. Um, to understand the moat and the competitive positioning, right now, Starbucks market cap probably, you know, post COVID around 70 billion, 75, Number two globally is Duncan Brands with a market cap around five. Um, cost of coffee was similar to Duncan around four or five. It was being subsequently bought by Jay, uh, by Coca-Cola for about eight bill. But it, it was extraordinary to understand like the moat that they had, they had created, how fast it scaled, the fact that Schultz background wasn't in coffee at all. It was very customer centric, which was similar, similar to my approach. And, um, they had done it pretty much unabated without any competition uh, beginning in the 80s. Starbucks is not an old company. Um, and it obviously started off as a bean retailer and Schultz was the one that pioneered the retail uh, model influenced by the Italian coffee culture. So we started humble beginnings, two stores. Then we went to, then we opened the next year, another two. Then we opened four. Uh, and I jumped full time at 12 in mid 2016. And uh, since then we've opened uh, over 40 locations. Wow. Wow. It's, um, yeah, so. it's fascinating to hear, um, I think, the, you know, the genesis of the company and, and how you describe the subterranean um, location um, and to think how far you've come in, in such a relatively um, short space of time, really. Um, it's also, I think, fascinating to think of the size of the market, um, you know, Starbucks at whether it's 75 billion or 100 billion, um, you know, it's, it's just such a really, really huge market. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Goliath, you know, it has, has, 40, has nearly 40,000 stores now, Starbucks and, um, you know, absolutely incredible free cash gener generation. Um, and they've done it, they've grown 
um, with the right values. You know, they were pioneers in the way that they looked after and treated what they call their partners, which are which are the staff members or the employees. Schultz was a real visionary from that from that aspect, and he was able to ba balance outstanding shareholder returns, but also like incredible staff retention. Um, you know, one of the big opportunities I also felt with Bluestone was the fact that real estate and retail uh, was moving towards an amenity. It had to be an amenity because office uh, landlords, which underpinned by you know, office tenants, which is, makes up the core material part of a rent roll, were under unique pressures as it, um, as it relates to increased adoption of technology, increased efficiency of space, work from home, which was a big theme even pre-COVID, yeah. and, and obviously um, share work spaces and co-working. So I thought there has to be a, a way to, to develop this amenity to and particularly appeal to younger people. And that's the millennial customer were the ones that were more interested in the premium coffee space. And that is entirely consistent with what you find in the best office buildings in Melbourne, in Brisbane, in Perth, in, in Sydney, that the, the class A office towers always have this amazing social amenity being a premium coffee shop. And that was sacrosanct in the US, but I thought there was a unique opportunity there. So that's that was the a number of different facets, but that's how I sort of found my way into building a, a, a brand and really a, a heavily Australian influence, authentic lifestyle brand. Yeah, great. Wow. Um, so, Nick, you've often in interviews mentioned the entrepreneurial itch um, to kind of jump into your first venture. What do you, how do you describe the qualities of an entrepreneur? Well, I think I think to be a to be an entrepreneur, you need a certain amount of um, curiosity and uh, you need to be rather inquisitive because I think the life of an entrepreneur or a small business owner, which is a glorified way to you know, call an entrepreneur, is um, about constantly challenging your value proposition and looking at how you can learn and adopt. So I do think you have to have an enormous amount of curiosity to, to challenge and to to see how that you can you can survive and, and grow. Um, certainly, uh, the values you're looking for above anything, uh, to do, you know, I believe are to do with resilience, um, to do with uh, dedication, hard work, enormous amount of sacrifice. Um, you certainly need courage. And the one thing that that I offer to entrepreneurs that often ask me about like whether they want to make the jump is I do think that you need to be a student of whatever industry or, or whatever company that you want to create, because I found a lot of solace through understanding the variables, which I can't control and which I can. And I do think uh, football, like elite sport, gave me some good grounding in those skills uh, because it's very much around process, process, process. You, you constantly kick the right way, you tackle the right way, it'll take care of the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. And also, even in banking, when you looked at a lot of a lot of companies and you think about market risk, like what you can really hedge for and manage, and then those that you, you, you can try the best and you understand your sort of volatility. And they served me well, because even though I was, in some respects, incredibly inexperienced in hospitality, I could understand what my downside was. I could understand where I could get it wrong and I could put in places or, or constantly iterate and challenge to get comfortable with, yeah, that's a, that's an acceptable risk. Right. And there's a, a tremendous amount of return if I get it right. So, um, you know, I would say you got to have a thick skin. Everyone's going to tell you that your, your, your idea is great or your idea is terrible. And even when it's going really well, everyone still has feedback. Um, and I think the Australian culture that we grow up with, and I'm often playing a lot of team sports and, you know, that, that, that classic candid nature does hold you really well to succeed in the U S in particular, um, because you can, you can take a little bit of constructive criticism and, you know, you don't drop your bundle, you take it for what it's worth and yep. you see if it applies or, you know, perhaps it doesn't. And, and I guess speaking of that kind of criticism, well, constructive criticism, but, but how do you uh, filter that? So I'm sure you've had, you know, plenty of people wanting to give you advice and uh, sometimes you seek it out, sometimes you don't seek it out. But, but what is that 
you know, what is the kind of, I guess, the steel in your spine that allows you to um, filter all the pieces of advice that you get and, and kind of make something out of it that is meaningful for you and your business? I, it's not an easy thing. I, I don't profess to be an expert in it and, you know, to think that it all just bounces off and like, you know, Teflon. But I think the first thing you've got to do is assume good intent. You have to assume that the intention of the person that's giving you advice is that they care and they believe in you and they think you can improve. I think once you, once you acknowledge that that's where it's coming from, I think you take it far less personally. Mm -hmm. um, regarding like my own experience and feedback, you know, I got an enormous amount playing football. You know, I was sacked three times in six years and my career, my childhood dream was over at the age of 23. Um, a lot of those years I was, was very down. I was very sad. I didn't believe that I could make it. I really probably struggled with, with self-confidence and belief, even though I was meant to be living out my childhood dream. And I think that really gave me like incredibly still resolve that whatever my next careers are, I'm going to be, I'm going to be okay with taking on feedback, treat it for what it is and constantly just try and learn and improve. Um, you know, it go, you go through different dynamics. Now, you know, I get obviously an incredible amount of customer feedback. Some of it is, and, and, and this is sort of a big part of our world is dealing with um, customer feedback digitally. So Yelp and TripAdvisor and what have yes, you. Yeah. Now, the hardest thing you find there is it's, it's quite asymmetrical. You can review my business, but I can't review you as a customer. Mm -hmm. And it's also through a digital veil. So it makes people feel very comfortable to say whatever they want without any recourse. Now that can obviously be taken with a lot of liberty and it can be sometimes probably a, 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 bit, a bit harsh, but I always talk with our team that directionally, directionally it's, it's accurate. So you might get one that's just, you know, someone's had a bad day and wants to take it out on Bluestone. But often you see themes, thematics, patterns, and the patterns are normally always right. So, you know, it's part of the world we live in now with the digital era that people can provide, provide what we call connectivity more frequently and um, efficiently than ever before. But you just got to sort of take it with a grain of salt, assume a good intent. And then, you know, if anything, and you're really doubtful and you, you need, go to those who know you best. Go to those business advisors, go to those mentors, go to your family and friends and ask for it you know, directly. And, and, and typically there'll be something there that, that you'll take away to improve on. And then I'm sure there's also a number of positive reinforcements. And hey, in hospitality and in service, when you're in a, a heavily human capital intensive industry, where we're doing sort of 12 and a half thousand transactions a day, pre-COVID, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting a lot of dynamic feedback. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I wanted to uh, ask you about data um, and, you know, how, I guess, intensively you were uh, pulling together or how kind of analytically you were pulling together those different sources. You just said 12 and a half thousand transactions on one side, you've got um, you know, social media kind of uh, data on the other side, like how, how do all those different um, areas of kind of data, how were they used by you in your business? And I, I want to kind of come back to it because I, I want to talk about the future a little bit as well and yeah. um, whether that, you know, whether that might change. But just in terms of how you have been using data, um, could you elaborate a little on that? Sure. I, I think one data is a massive part of our business, but I think what we did, which is quite common with a lot of small, fast growing businesses is they have a number of disparate sources and they have a lot of software and it's not integrated to the, to the most proficient way. And I think in, if I look about Bluestone and what's happened with COVID, COVID has ripped off this layer where the need to use digital solutions and contactless is so paramount that these different systems and the need for more efficiency because you're under revenue pressure 
has accelerated at a level that I certainly wouldn't have anticipated last year or even uh, three months ago. Um, you do have an incredible amount of external and internal data. Internal about you know, how efficient the business is, uh, is running, um, how dynamic you can be. We are looking at everything from, we have systems which look at actual versus theoretical cogs dynamically. We have uh, predictive ordering. We have predictive scheduling. There is an incredible amount of automation and machine learning that, that will go into all of retail. And it will be a necessity because of uh, the cost pressures, I think, that everyone's going to face in a lower um, average unit volume world. But on the external side, uh, we are really excited. We, we started investing very heavily into controlling um, every time you engage with the brand. It's done in a quite omni-channel way. And we've been building behind the scenes, I would say, resourcefully and intelligently um, aggregating different systems into one sort of data warehouse, one, one dashboard. Um, I think we, we made a lot of progress, thankfully, because we were going to launch our Order Ahead app as part of a big campaign with Luxury Escapes in March. We were offering two of our locals uh, a, a guided tour of Australia. Now, obviously, uh, international travel in March uh, wasn't gonna be the flavor. So we pulled the pin, but out of necessity, we pivoted the whole business in 12 hours, the stores that we continue to keep open, which were primarily in residential areas, to 100% contactless. The only way that you could order Bluestone Lane was, is via a mobile order ahead app. You can't pay, there's no point of sale, there's no card, there's no cash. Um, and that has been very, very interesting to see the patterns, the buying behavior and what we're learning. There's certainly, there's, a, there's, a, there's an absolute data science to this. Mm -hmm. um, when someone orders an avocado smash as their first order, you know, the repeat and retention rate and the LTV is very, very different when someone orders a beetroot latte for their first beverage. There's a lot of these trends and a lot of um, uh, predictive and um, what I would call targeted campaigns that are going to be a core part of our business. And we had an amazing call today um, with our digital team for three hours debating it about how the cafe world's going to look like. It was previously heavily based on human connection and service. That's not going to be part of the future. And now the pro the, the really the, the value proposition is going to be based on, on health and safety. Uh, and then making it as convenient as possible. And we're gonna have a very restricted seating capacity. So how do we make sure that it works from a unit economic basis, but how do we make sure that it really is part of our omni-channel loyalty program? And that's, that's incredibly exciting. And that will be without a doubt, if you look at COVID, like what's been the most transformational change, you know, I think from a business perspective, it's gonna be, five to 10 years of, of digital transformation that's been compressed into three months, four months, five, six months. And it's not just enterprise level, which may have been moving at that rate of speed already, but it's gonna be at the SME level, which, which is going to be quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, you know, we're, that's what we're focused on because um, that's where we believe the world's gonna be for the next year, year and a half out of necessity. You know, 60 days to learn a new habit. I don't think in potentially a year and a half you're going to unwind behavioral change and buying behavior. So that's what we're, you know, that's the one area when you look at your total cost structure and like where you can afford to invest. You know, in our opinion, we could not uh, afford to slow down investment in digital on the work we were doing. Um, we had to find, you know, cut from other areas and, and reinvest, but capital expenditure in digital and tech is the absolute priority, I think, even for a business like ours that's, that's you know, heavily service-based. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, is, um, it is absolutely fascinating how, um, you know, the, the business is going to have to, and, and your hospitality industry, how the, the adaptation is, is going to have to, uh, is going to have to come. And I keep hearing the phrase, we are all startups again. Um, in inverted commas. Uh, do you agree with this? And, and is there anything that's really applicable to your thinking right now? I 
I think it's highly applicable because I, I feel right now, now is the time where you can rewrite anything that is suboptimal and look at every part of your value proposition and challenge it. I think that you also have the opportunity to try things like you never thought before. You know, we used to, we used to debate heavily around um, trialing new menu items and whether they'd be received well. And we could have two months of debating a certain dish. Now it's dynamic, it's instantaneous. If it makes sense, we can trial it. If it doesn't work, we can pull it straight off. If it really works, we can scale it. You know, I think that now there's no downside. You know, like it could, in many cases, like business couldn't get any worse, right? A lot of businesses have zero revenue. So what's the harm in, in trying to iterate and, uh, and rapid prototype? I don't, I don't think there is. So with us, it, we are breaking down businesses and seeing how we can rebuild them for the COVID world and how they're going to work financially, how it's going to work for the customer journey and experience, um, how it's going to work for the long term, which is all about um, LTV and brand loyalty and retention. So I do agree. I do agree with that. So again, I would have had a different view in, in, uh, in months before. I would have been about like constantly iterating and trialing and tinkering. But now's your chance to wholesale change because you've got nothing to lose. You have like to. A lot of businesses... <laughs> Yeah, a lot of businesses like are going to be the most extraordinary ideas that come out of this pandemic and crisis. There's going to be enormous silver linings and there will be opportunities. Might not be right now in the short term, right in the midst of it, but there will be tremendous opportunities and businesses that emerge that'll be wonderful for all society. Yeah. So just kind of, uh, it's, it is uh, interesting to he hear the way, you know, you're thinking about the opportunity right now um, and the opportunity to, uh, the time, I suppose, that you're given, you know, or allowed right now to, to really think about um, the, the business and, and, and what you're going to need to do going forward. I think something that's interesting is, um, you know, how do you or how are you and, and the team kind of challenging that desire to preserve the status quo for your business for when we come out of this situation? You know, I can imagine that for a lot of businesses that it's kind of the 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 hope for the you know the hope for the v or we we just get past this and then we kind of pick up and we keep going i mean how do you challenge that that desire to preserve status quo because i think it's a very normal and natural thing um and i'm just interested you know how how you and the team kind of work on that i think it it, it comes down to your view on the economy and what the new normal is going to be like. I think that we took the view that was very conservative that this is going to be a dramatic change and then operating as you, you previously did will, will never be the case. I think that we, we viewed this as beyond transformational and then you, you then suddenly realize, Hey, most things that worked, uh, pre-COVID probably aren't going to work anymore. So I do believe there's a lot of lessons in being patient and observing. Now, if you had, you, you know, the one predication on that is the fact that you have sufficient capital to be able to buy a bit of time. Now I, I'm in the fortunate position that I have some capital, not a lot, but you know, I've got investors and we, we were, we're fortunate from that perspective. And we're fortunate that we have scale and some diversification. Um, and, but I believe that, that the, we're, we're as a society and how we reemerge from this world, it's not going to be um, an exponential sort of growth. It's gonna be bumpy. There's gonna be uh, the reawakening and then there could be, you know, back to being quite dormant and my view is that best to be patient, observe. I don't think there's tremendous advantage in our space in being first mover. I would rather try, learn, see, what, see what's working well, bring in that feedback, look at the peers before 
um, radically scaling the new operating sort of mandate. Right. But, um, you know, I, I think that capital will be king here without a doubt, uh, because when the world emerges and when they lift restrictions and hospitality in New York is part of phase three, uh, which could be a while away, you know, it could be one month, it could also be three months. I do think that there's a high likelihood that the fall is going to provide a number of challenges, which may require social distancing, extreme social distancing measures that we're experiencing right now. Um, and I do think that that will cause a, a tremendous drain on capital. So being very prudent and efficient and just patient, I think is important. Um, we're not here to win in the next couple of months. I think for us, like we want to win over a longer period of time. And that's going to require you probably saying, as it relates to rolling out and commercialising, no, more than yes, but um, a hell of a lot of iteration and challenge internally. And uh, I'm loving some of the debates we're, we're having right now, um, because you can literally sort of say anything because you're building, it's like you're building the company again. And that's part of it's incredibly sad. But um, part of it is invigorating that you're working on something that could be improved and you could learn. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's the way you've got to take it. You know, you've yeah. got to be optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nick, you, um, you talked a little bit then about kind of capital. And, uh, you know, as you said, one of the great things that capital gives you right now is the ability to be patient. Um, are there any lessons learned for you in terms of capital structure or do you have any advice for any other um, SME or startups even out there around capital? Yeah, certainly. So we, we're hundred uh, percent equity funded. Um, we have all of our store growth being through ca internal cash flow generation and investment uh, in our preferred equity rounds. Um, we've done five rounds, um, which, which um, we're very, very grateful for the support we've received. I, I would say there's a couple of lessons regarding raising, raising capital. Um, one, if you have the opportunity to do so, I think you should. Um, irrespective of your growth ambitions, um, it can give you incredible focus and alignment, accountability, um, and it can give you more confidence to trial things. Um, I think about how to um, raise venture capital, growth capital is certainly an art form, you know, working in banking for over a decade. Uh, it it didn't equip me at all for raising money in the VC growth equity world. It is a unique animal. Um, and I think you learn from uh, a little bit of trial and error, but a lot from listening to other entrepreneurs and seeing how they negotiate. Um, and then, you know, if you, you really do need to, to get a, a great sort of commercial lawyer who's well experienced in VC to talk you through because they're terms that you've never heard before and mechanisms and, and uh, you know, ways to, to manage um, uh, certain rights and, and uh, you know, protocols when things go well or when things go poorly. Um, but, you know, I, I think right now for us, um, you know, capital and having raised some capital late last year has been the lifeline you know if we didn't have that and we were in a constrained i think that it would be lights out you know there's no one really looking to do a lot of deals right now i think if you're an investor you want to be pretty patient because there's going to be an incredible amount of opportunities and then if you do need to raise capital i think it's that like heavily heavily distressed rates yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, I spoke to a, a, one of the largest PE firms in the world last week, just to touch base. And they said they'd never been busier than ever. And uh, that their only thing they're looking at is deeply, deeply distressed assets. So, you know, the old saying go, you only want to raise capital when you don't need it. And, you know, you never want to raise capital when you need it. And everyone knows it. And despite you know, you try and posture with investors and come across as very confident and that you've got plenty of liquidity. You know, they're, they're most investors that are, that, are, uh, that are professional and that are good, understand and, and sense when things are a little bit more urgent than what they are. And, you know, they're, they're acting on behalf of their LPs, you know, and uh, invent their own investors to, to get the, boat, the best outcome. But you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have um, a very, you know, significant minority position with RSE Ventures. 
Um, you know, they've got extraordinary experience across a whole number of different avenues from uh, from their ownership and uh, positions in, in other hospitality brands like Milk Bar and Mama Fuku and Ann Pizza through to other investments in media, Vayner, um, through to investments in sports. So um, it's been it's been a real awakening. It's been a, a you learn so much about um, uh, you know, investor relations, and also you learn so much about uh, your own company when you when you structure more formal governance around not only just the board, but also your reporter reporting your budget and your operating requirements, which are consistent typically with what the investor and you agree to when you receive their capital. It's uh, it's yeah. So I don't know if that's, that's no, 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 it's, you know, question. It's, yeah. Um, you know, uh, as you said, there's, um, I think your experience is really, um, you know, really good, uh, good advice for, you know, anyone out there that might be, um, you know, thinking of uh, taking on an entrepreneurial journey. And certainly, you know, as you say, the kind of VC and PE worlds are, are worlds of the, their own. Um, and uh, they can be, I don't know, opaque, <laughs> tricky to <Yeah>. navigate, <laughs> tricky to get yeah. into. Um, so it's good. It's good to hear. It's really good to hear your yeah, uh, pick, on that. Picking. So we started with we were bootstrapped. So our first round was three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. I did half of it, and uh, two a group of friends that I actually met through the New York Magpies uh, Footy Club, where I played the first year I arrived. Um, they were in the industry, they invested and uh, they're still good friends and they've had, they've, they're all having enormous careers. And then uh, two of my fellow colleagues at ANZ. Um, and, you know, it started and, you know, with skin in the game and it was very, very bootstrapped. And then we did a, a further round after that with a million dollars. So it wasn't until we probably were doing closer to sort of six, eight million that we started to solicit more institutional, what I call family office capital. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, if you don't take that, that friends and family money or you don't put your own money in yourself, you know, it, it's very hard and challenging to get to the institutional growth equity stage. You know, you, you, you've got to sort of keep it going however you can. You've got to treat every dollar uh, like it's your last. That's probably one thing if I, if I reflect about um, an area of improvement for, for me as a leader and, um, and also the company is like, I think when you do get a big injection of capital, sometimes you lose a bit of that focus. You know, it's sort of growth at all costs and you, you don't challenge some of your, your investment decisions as rigorously when it's your own, absolutely like it comes directly out of your own bank account. But that's sort of an experience and something we learn. And without a doubt, like I think COVID is going to knock a lot of that exuberance out that um, a lot of those very, very hefty valuations and liquidities all over the place. Yeah, there's a lot of dry powder, but I do think it's going to be more judiciously allocated. Yeah. So you're going to have to be very, very uh, conscious on, um, on what you spend and what you invest in. You know, it's, it's yes. the reality. Yeah, yeah, I get we we I get that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to just shift gears a little bit. So, um, with New York as the epicenter, really, of the coronavirus pandemic, kind of right now, and the majority of your sites being in Manhattan, I mean, how? I mean, is it really worth reopening with restricted? kind of occupancy and social distance practices and how, how do you see that kind of playing out? I mean, you did mention that it's a third phase kind of situation um, and perhaps even by the fall and we're, you know, we're going to have stop and start. I mean, what, what's your thinking around, I guess, your, your business and, and just, I suppose, hospitality restaurant venues in general about um, those kind of issues with occupancy and social distancing and so forth? Yeah, I, I think this is, it's going to be a very significant challenge. Like I don't have all the answers now, but the, the things I do know is successful hospitality venues, much like anything else that has high operating leverage. So a significant ratio of fixed to variable costs really struggles without full capacity utilization. You know, you need all those seats 
field. Um, because once you do, you have an exponential growth in, in operating profit. Um, the biggest challenge you've got now is you're going to have a lot of fixed costs. You still need certain positions to run a coffee machine and run a kitchen, but you're going to have like dramatically restricted seats. Um, that is going to be an enormous challenge for, for restaurants. It's going to be an enormous challenge for hair salons. It's going to be an enormous challenge for anything that's highly reliant on high occupancy um, and uh, it's service-based. For us, we have, two, we have two concepts within the one brand. We have coffee shops that are primarily focused on a captive audience. It's almost like an annuity. Uh, you focus on the most dense areas where people go to work and you know that you'll see them every day or every couple of days. Um, those stores will continue to operate the way they are now, heavily focused on convenience and speed and they'll be mobile only. So um, I think that's going to be the new world or the order ahead and you, you come and pick up and, and you leave. Um, it may change in a few months, but that's the way that we see it. We don't see any material change. The challenge we've got in New York with a lot of those captive stores, which are at the bottom of a million plus square feet office buildings, is what certainty do we have on the occupancy? You know, like that's, that's and then what certainty do we have on the future occupancy state? Yeah, I think a lot of, the majority of people have had reasonably positive work from home experiences, and they've probably changed their mindset around uh, flexible work arrangements. It was probably something that was introduced and um, it was common, but I don't think it was probably adopted as robustly across the whole corporate spectrum as it probably is going to be now. Um, so that's a big challenge we've got there. And that's where the majority of our coffee shops in New York are closed because the central business districts aren't there. Uh, cafes primarily are focused on residential areas where they've been around destination. Probably not the place you go every single day because 90% of transactions are two or more people. So it's normally where you go uh, with a friend um, as part of some social connection. Um, it, it, it facilitates uh, a, an experience between you both. Um, and, you know, they're, they're probably going to do um, better as it relates to delivery and curbside pickup, but they are dealing with the constraints of, of a, lot, lot, a lot less seats. So we, we, delivery was not a big part of our business at all. We had a very, I would say, inconsistent relationship with one delivery partner. In the space of three weeks, we onboarded another three. So now we have all delivery partners. Um, we didn't really do much curbside pickup. We didn't have the order ahead feature uh, really slated early on for the cafe business, but, but obviously that changed. So um, the revenue split in cafes is going to be quite dramatic. You know, we thought that you know, typically it's, uh, the revenue would say 80% dining, 10% takeaway, 10% delivery. I think the new normal we're looking at is about 30% dining. Uh, you know, 30 uh, to 40% um, uh, curbside um, pickup, uh, order ahead, and then uh, 30 to 40 um, with delivery. So a dramatic change and how you manage and utilize space, the roles and positions you have now, your pricing mechanisms, your menu, all of that is being engineered right now. Um, and they're the calls that we're having debates over and over and over again, which is extremely um, healthy. And, uh, you know, I think it's a quite a fascinating piece. And I think it's also brought a lot of enthusiasm um, during such a dark and like heartbreaking period that mm -hmm. we're, we're now rallying around, okay, we can do this. We can build it back. We can, we can reinvent ourselves. Um, more than anything, out of necessity, the business was actually performing very, very well. Uh, this this Q1, we were really excited. Tremendous momentum in some of our ancillary businesses like wholesale and events. Uh, we had a brand new retail SVP that took us six months to find. Uh, he'd just been onboarded mid-Jan. So things were really, and the exec team was, was really solidifying. But, um, you know, it is what it is. And uh, I'm confident we're going to find our way forward. But uh, it's without a doubt, 
going to be like trying to win a boxing match with only one hand. Uh, it's, it's not straightforward. And if anything, a lot of it's going to come down to the awareness of people, the, the, the public, the consumers to shop small, shop local, shop independents. Because I think the big guys, QSR, they'll actually chew up more, more market share. A lot of them have, uh, have drive-throughs and drive-throughs will, will see positive same store sales comps. Um, uh, they also uh, have a scale and efficiency that's, that's pretty incredible. We all know about uh, the stories of McDonald's and Chipotle and what have you. Um, a lot of their food is heavily processed, not particularly healthy and not fresh, mm -hmm. but you know, they get those scale advantages. Independents don't have that. Small businesses don't have that. They don't have the capital luxury. So the more that you can rally around small business, um, I think that the better your, the, 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 how do I put it? the fabric of suburbs, the cosmopolitan nature, the tapestry of areas in which we love. If you look at New York, like it is the epicenter of uh, culture and art and fashion and, um, and restaurants. And, you know, we don't want that to look to be lost. We don't want a homogenous society where the options are limited. But, uh, you know, it's going to be vitally important that we, uh, we vote and we march with our feet. Yeah. No, and it's all that, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you think about the communities in which you live and um, I'm sitting here listening to you thinking about, you know, my community area and, and, you know, once we're allowed to kind of get out and about, you know, I think it's interesting because it might be an iterative process where you're kind of more comfortable actually just uh, widening your boundaries a bit, right? And then kind of coming back home and then kind of maybe a, a few weeks later widening a bit, a little bit further. But I think yeah. that idea of community is um, super important, super important. And I think also, you know, you'll be, you, you benefit from the ability to have different levers, levers to pull. So, you know, you're not just to come in, sit down like a, a traditional restaurant or whatever. So, you know, you, you're able to kind of move those units around differently and, and um and so that that uh you know that's a very fortunate position um you know for you to be in and as you were speaking i was thinking about some other types of restaurants that are really just predominantly to come in and sit down and be served and so they've got you know some some deep challenges as well um going forward so um Co coffee coffee lends itself to that which yes, is very exactly. fortunate like a lot yeah. of people come and get a coffee and um, yeah, you know, from that perspective, we're in a much more fortunate position than, than others, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking, Nick, about um, kind of uh, public policy at this time, and I'm interested in your take on how uh, that, that experience has been for you and, and any of your employees and um, what, um, it, you know, what it, any additional advice that you would be giving to authorities at the moment in terms of, you know, um, their fiscal expenditure, the success of or otherwise of various programs that have been put in place. How's that kind of worked out for you? This is a fascinating topic, one that I love um, talking at length about and, and debating. Um, certainly, you know, you've seen unprecedented measures to try and stimulate the US economy in particular. and um, one of the, the, there's two that have been extraordinarily um, impactful for us. The first one has certainly been enhanced unemployment insurance, the additional 600 per week that was granted by the federal government on top of, you know, what you could, you could receive from the states. Um, that, that brought us enormous solace when we had to make some extraordinarily hard decisions about the majority of our team. When you have revenue that declines 85, 90%, you have very, very limited levers to try and preserve everybody. Your stores are gonna be closed and you have no idea when they're gonna reopen. This wasn't a thing communicated by the different states that you're gonna close for two weeks and then we're back. Mm. This was, you're gonna close, we have no idea when you're gonna reopen. Um, the majority of people 
of parade is that they, they will do whatever they can to look after their team. You've got to assume good intent. But there comes to a point where you've got to make a decision about whether you have a chance to reopen or not. So what's so fascinating about that enhanced benefit is even if, if conditions dramatically improve and certain states are, are becoming more liberal with, with re-energising their own local economy, getting people back to work when they have been receiving a substantial amount of money, in some cases more than they were earning when they were fully employed, um, and then also dealing with the, the obvious risk of leaving your home uh, and reintegrating in society is, is a challenging one. So even if, for example, in New York, they said everything's back to normal, flick the switch, I think we would have extraordinary challenges in getting people to come back to work. Now, even though that the unemployment rate is anticipated right now anywhere between 13 and say 20%, People are entitled to this unprecedented benefit, those who are applicable and, and have been receiving it. So that's, that's a real conundrum that a lot of yeah. entrepreneurs I know I'm speaking to are saying that like, even if they want to get going, they have no staff to hire. Right. Um, that's going to be really interesting next month because as it moves towards the maturity, the expiration date, I think you're going to see a greater urgency. Um, maybe the federal government extends it maybe it's done and uh you know everyone's going to be so desperate to go back to work so that's been one the other one is obviously the the paycheck protection program the ppp that has been um universally written about um every day and the new york times is talking about the ppp now um the ppp uh the intentions were incredibly noble and is a very 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 scale and extraordinarily large program right uh 750 800 billion and to basically shovel it out or throw it out the windows in uh four to four six weeks is extraordinary um there were some certain loopholes that uh, people have exploited um uh, the loopholes were well they're not necessarily loopholes there was just loose language in which you could you could make the most of um one of the biggest issues that hospitality in particular or retail have faced with the PPP is there's an expectation that you spend or it's mandated that you try and spend the vast majority, 75% of it on uh, paying people's salaries and the payroll cost um, during an eight week period. And if you do so, um, there's a, the, most likely and based on a calculation, you'll have the loan forgiven. Mm. Now, the biggest challenge that I've had as a, as a hospitality proprietor is I've, you know, we applied for a PPP and um, if I received it, say four or five weeks ago, I would only have a certain amount of weeks left in which I have to rehire and reemploy and re-engage. Now, biggest challenges I have is the majority of my stores are prohibited from operating. Right. So, it's been a bit of a catch-22. Um, it's been a saviour, but the ability to actually have it forgiven um, by spending on payroll um, is, is really hard because you don't have stores. You don't have opportunities to, to really pay people. And, um, you know, and even reopening or contravening guidance wouldn't probably be the best thing for societal health. So, um, it's been, and then that posed in the example of like, are you, you know, pose the thought, are you best to get a PPP? Are you best to apply for it if you can't use it? So then suddenly it just becomes debt on the balance sheet yeah. and yeah. another obligation. So it's, you know, the, the, the instruments that have been used and implemented to try and get the economy going have been absolutely noble. Um, the execution is always very, very, very hard at um, the scale and breadth that, that they tried to move at. But, um, you know, I think it'll be something that'll be talked about for decades to come. And, uh, you know, without a doubt, there's going to be some retrospective um, uh, analysis and, and audit of uh, recipients. And I have found some really interesting trends where um, I, I do believe there's also potential moral hazard, like significant moral hazard. Um, 
between those who are determining who's who is applicable for a PPP and who actually got the money. And, um, you know, I can understand them, but, uh, you know, I think that'll be talked over for many, uh, over many dinner parties to come. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Hopefully dinner parties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or in coffee shops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, um, Nick, look, that it's a, we're almost out of time, actually. Um, I, I could ask, I could talk to you for hours, but um, I think we're, you know, that's a great note on which to conclude. Uh, I really do appreciate your willingness to discuss your business and, and provide your insights today. And I'm sure that everyone on the call, uh, as I know I have, has absorbed a lot of great content. Um, we all wish you, you know, the very best uh, on the continuation of the journey. And uh, we look forward to, um, you know, seeing the, the iterations as they evolve and, um, and wish you continued success. Um, so I'd also like to thank the audience. Um, I greatly appreciated all your question and um, hope that most of the direction uh, of the questions has been covered off today. So, but yeah, so I just wanted to uh, give a big thanks to Nick, first of all. Um, um, for the audience, I, I wanted to uh, let people know that there will be a recording available on the AAA website uh, in about 24 hours. And also at this point, just to remind you that this webinar is part of a series um, and our upcoming events uh, will be found also on the American Australian Association website. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring this webinar to a conclusion and uh, wish everyone uh, all the very best. Thank you very much. <laughs>